on the air with a key meeting today for the families of Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan as they make the case face to face with President Biden to do whatever it takes to bring their people home. Just ahead, my conversation with a top White House official on those talks with the Kremlin. Plus, we'll take you live to Ukraine, where the country's president wants the world to pay attention to a new mass grave found in Izum. What we're now hearing from the Secretary of State and our correspondent's journey to try and get there. And with Bitcoin now half the price it was to start the year, the White House is laying out new rules to regulate crypto. Why you know the industry is paying very close attention. Plus, Chrissy Teigen redefining her miscarriage as a life-saving abortion, saying this is a conversation we need to have in a post-Roe America. We've got more on that emotional story. And a new study says shows made by or starring Latinos are some of the most popular on streaming. Why representation is really only the first step. That's a little later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you on this Friday. And any minute now, we're expecting to get some new details on what President Biden is telling the families of Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan, the two high-profile Americans who are behind bars in Russia for charges the U.S. says are bogus. We haven't heard from them or the White House just yet, but this is a big deal because, as a reminder, Griner faces nine years on drug possession charges. Her legal team is appealing that. Whelan, who's been in Russia since 2018, is on a 16-year sentence for spying. Both families are putting the pressure on President Biden to bring these people home. So what is the holdup? It's the Kremlin, right? At least that's how the U.S. is framing it, because the U.S. Off, uh, offer, rather, of arms dealer Victor Boot apparently is not going to cut it. Moscow wants a two-for-two -two deal, with sources telling NBC News the Russians may want Boot and another Russian prisoner. Just a couple hours ago, I asked National Security Council John spokes, uh, spokesperson, rather, John Kirby, about the possibility of this kind of thing actually happening. Here's what he told me. What can you tell us about that, and is that something that the U.S. is willing to consider? I would rather not get into the details uh, of the um, of the offer that's on the table. We do remain in discussion. We do remain. There are you know mm. ne negotiations going on, back and forth going on. So it's an active conversation. But we obviously haven't gotten where we want to get to. We haven't secured their release. Carol Lee is following this story for us from the White House. And Carol, you heard what Kirby there just told me about negotiations. You've got Russian Foreign Minister Sergey Lavrov coming to New York next week for the UN General Assembly. Is the president, is the White House pushing for a possible sit down between him and Secretary of State Tony Blinken? Well, we heard from the State Department, Hallie, that the, they're open to a meeting if they think it would be productive. And I asked White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre today if the president expected to make any progress during the UNGA, that week that he's in New York for UNGA. And she basically deflected the question and said, you know, he's always wants to make progress, but UNGA has been traditionally, I've covered more of them than I would like to admit, a place where the U.S. and Russia tend to do a little business. It's They're guaranteed to, have, to see each other here once a year. And the, the problem for the U.S. is that it, this, the way this usually goes or has gone in the past is that they get commitments from Russia during meetings in UNGA on the international stage when Russia wants to seem as if it's being a, a, a player on the national stage. And then Russia reneges on that. So it's not clear that next week is going to be a pivotal point. But it could. What you're hearing from the White House is that they have this offer on the table. It's worth noting, though, that this offer has been on the table since July. So this is not some new offer. This is It's been a while since they put this forward. And the administration is basically saying, look, the Russians are just not being serious here. Are we to read anything into the fact that the negotiations are going so slowly? I think about the pressure that I know is on the White House here. I think back to yeah. Trevor Reed, another detained American. We covered a lot on this show. His family extremely vocal about wanting to pressure the White House to get him home. Yeah, so one of the, the things, the president's under a lot of pressure f f to bring Paul Whelan and, Whelan and Brittany Griner home. It's a lot, a lot of public pressure. He's come under some criticism, the argument from people who think he's not focused on this enough. So part of what he's trying to do today is to personally tell the sister of Paul Whelan and the wife of Brittany Griner that he is very focused on this and this is a top priority. But what he can't really, what we don't know is whether he can say that there's been any progress because everything that we're hearing publicly from the administration is that there isn't really any progress here. Mm. Carol Lee, live for us there, just outside the White House. Carol, good to see you. Thank you for staying on top of that one for us. Appreciate it. We've got to get to some breaking market news, and you may not totally love it because stocks are closing lower today across the board to end one of the worst weeks of the year. You've got the Dow mostly recovered, at least today, after a 400-point drop, but still finishing off Friday down 4% this week. 
The S&P and NASDAQ both down around 5% for the week. And that Dow drop you're looking at driven by rough FedEx news. With the company saying it'll fall $500 million short of what it wanted to bring in this year, revenue-wise. And why does that matter? Transportation stocks are considered kind of a canary in the economic coal mine, if you will. A measure of how strong the industrial and manufacturing industries are and supply and demand. The CEO of FedEx even saying the quiet part out loud. He thinks we're on the verge of a global recession. Seema Modi joins us now. So Seema, when people hear things like, hey, really powerful CEO says the words global recession, what are people supposed to take away from it? Well, I think what they're trying to figure out, Hallie, is if those comments from Fed CEO, FedEx CEO Rod Subramaniam about an impending global session, recession is reflective of what's going on just at FedEx or if this is the start of what many companies are about to say about the health of the U.S. economy. Now, stocks, as you say, did sell off not just today but this week. And overall, if we take a step back, the S&P 500 is now down about 20% from its recent high. What we're hoping going into next week is that the Federal Reserve at its monetary policy weekend uh, week meeting, which starts on Tuesday, and then we get the announcement on Wednesday, will provide a crucial update on where we're at in the economy. What did he make, Chair Powell, of the latest inflation print for the month of August? That could perhaps help investors and people at home make sense of what they should be doing with their portfolio right now, Hallie. Should they be allocating more or less money into stocks versus bonds, be more defensive? That level of clarity perhaps we'll get next week. Seema Modi from CNBC. Seema, thank you very much. Appreciate it. In Massachusetts today, migrants caught in the middle of a political fight were told they could leave Martha's Vineyard to get shelter and food at a military base in Cape Cod. This comes 48 hours after Florida Governor Ron DeSantis had planes pick up the migrants from a Texas Air Force base and drop them off on the island. Something similar is happening in New York on an even bigger scale. Four to six busloads of people each day are now arriving in the city, look at this, with no specific federal resources on the way. Many of these migrants coming from Texas, some from Arizona. Let's get right to Antonia Hilton, who is live from outside, a new asylum seeker resource center in New York. And it's not like we talk about a resource center. There aren't tons of them, and they are already stretched thin there in the city where you are. Yeah, the resources right now in New York City are at a breaking point, according to Mayor Adams. And, you know, look, the city right now is still having this open arms, you know, open door policy. But the question right now is how long is that going to last? What we've seen happen all day here is migrants arriving, you know, in family groups, in groups of usually young men arriving here to get resources that range from free metro cards to help making doctor's appointments to help getting their kids enrolled in school in some cases. And many of them, they don't know about the political football going on here between Republican governors and Mayor Eric Adams here in New York. They just really want help and some understanding. Take a listen to some of the conversations we had. ¿Cómo fue la experiencia, el viaje aquí? El viaje acá por todo Centroamérica es un viaje demasiado, un trayecto muy largo, un poco difícil, pero no un poco, imposible. No imposible. ¿Qué tipo de ayuda está adentro? Acá, acá nos ayuda a conseguir abogado, este, lo dan para la, nuestra salud, para una cita con médico, lo ayudan a sacar el, el, el ID. ID. Mucho, mucha ayuda nos beneficia. Muchas orientaciones, pues, también. You know, Hallie, keep in mind that in the backdrop of all the political infighting here, you know, these are people who have just completed dangerous and exhausting journeys through all of Central America. Virtually everyone we've met today is coming, coming from Venezuela and originally came to Texas and then took a kind of confusing long bus ride here to New York City where they're starting their lives all over again. Many of them have dates. They're trying to make their asylum claims. But even with all this help, there is a lot of uncertainty, Hallie. And, you know, I wonder what you're hearing from city officials about what they want from federal officials where I am in Washington, because, as you know, our colleague Julia Ainsley has exclusive NBC News reporting on more and more friction inside the Biden administration, White House, the DHS, on what to do with the current immigration system writ large. 
That's right. And for weeks now, Mayor Eric Adams here has been calling on the Biden administration to do more for New York, more meaning more money, more resources, help with housing and the shelter system, which is at its breaking point here in New York, help with things like translation services. You know, New York has this mandate in place, a right to shelter for all adults, regardless of immigration status. And that's been established through, you know, legal challenges and court settlements. But right now, the Adams administration is looking at what they can do to essentially unravel that because they say it's just not going to be possible. If people continue to come by the thousands every week, it's not going to be sustainable here, Hallie. What has surprised you the most as you're having some of these conversations, Antonia, with migrants who have come in from, like we said, I think most of them, correct me if I'm wrong, most from Texas. We know that Texas has been doing this, some from Arizona. Does that encapsulate it? Virtually everyone here today has come from Texas. They have been moving from one shelter to another. Many of them are staying in shelters in Brooklyn, actually, and they were asking me, you know, I don't, I, I'm in the middle of Manhattan, the west side of Manhattan, and they have to figure out their way all the way into deep Brooklyn right now. Wow. They've gotten free Metro cards, some assistance from folks. They're leaving, literally walking right by me and going to try to get their, you know, first meal here on the ground. So, you know, there's a bit of bewilderment. There's a lot of exhaustion on the faces of the families, especially the ones who have little kids. You know, I've been co covering immigration for a really long time. And, you know, often when people arrive here, they don't know all the ins and outs of the political conversations that have been happening around them. But they are aware in some sense that they have become pawns, right? That they were put on a bus. They've been thrown yeah. here to New York City. Some of them have family members in other places. Some of them don't have any relatives at all and had no plan of what they were going to do here. So it just kind of adds right to the confusion in all of this. Allie. Antonia Hilton, thank you for bringing us this reporting. Appreciate it. We've got to take it to Ukraine now, where today the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, says the whole world has to see what is happening there right now after officials discovered more than 400 bodies in a new mass burial site in Izum. And we want to warn you, you're going to find this video disturbing. We're only going to play it once. We're just going to show you because it's important to see this. It's important to show the world. This is a city that the Ukrainians just took back from Russia a few days ago. So obviously some of the images are, are blurred out out of respect to these victims and their bodies. The mood now, it is a stark contrast to the sort of celebratory nature that we had seen earlier. Bodies are getting exhumed with an official saying most of them had signs of violent death and horrifically, horrifically, they say there were signs of children's bodies there too. It's not clear yet who is buried or how they died, but most of them are thought to be civilians. Russian forces got control of the city back in March, and local officials there say that when they did take over, as many as 1,000 people died from a lack of medicine and medical care under Russian occupation. Aaron McLaughlin is joining us now live from... Aaron, I understand you have been trying to make your way to Izum. You had been making this sort of journey here on what one White House official told me today was just the depravity of what we have seen in Izum. Yeah, that's that's right, Hallie. We made it as far today as Balaklia town, about a half hour away from Izum. Ukrainian officials have been tightly controlling media access to the town of Izum itself. But we were able to reach this nearby town and we talked to residents there and they were describing what life was like under Russian occupation six months of Russian occupation. I was speaking to one man who said that the Russians, when they moved in, they cut off electricity. They cut off the running water supply. They cut off contact to the outside world. There was no cell phone. There was no way of, for him to reliably contact his children living in other parts of Ukraine. No way for him to tell them that he was OK, they set up checkpoints inside of his village, made the Ukrainians that lived there carry documents, indiscriminately searched their homes, also notified them that they would be reading all of their mail. It was truly a terrifying experience, according to this man. He said that he was also there, of course, when the Ukrainian troops turned up. He said he was very nervous at first at the battle potentially that would unfold, a potential clash between Ukrainian troops and Russian troops. But then the Russian troops simply turned and ran away as fast as they could. He said destroying everything in their wake, including the local a bridge. So that is a scenario facing 
hundreds, thousands potentially of residents that were living in the Kharkiv Oblast were living under Russian occupation. And now we're learning of the horrors from Ukrainian officials that have unfolded there in that city of Izum. It's a city of some 50,000. Right now they've discovered a mass grave, as you mentioned, with some 400, more than 400, um, mainly civilians, they say, many of them children, and they're vowing justice for each and every one of those victims. But there are also real fears tonight that potentially hundreds more uh, graves have yet to be found. Allie. You know, I, I, there is this discussion of if, if this is evidence of a war crime, and that is something that I also spoke about with the White House official today. Is this proof, right, that Russia has committed war crimes? There is this broader investigation that's happening with law enforcement agents in, agencies in just the last week. I want to get this number right. Opening more than 200 criminal proceedings just this week related to, to what Russia has done in Ukraine. Help us understand that and help us understand what life is like for some of these people who have been living under Russian occupation. Yeah, well, that 200 cases that they opened this week is on top of the thousands and thousands of cases already underway. You know, I was actually out with the war crimes prosecutors in the Kharkiv region months ago. Back then, they were vowing to prosecute every single war crime, every single allegation made against uh, their Russian occupiers. It, it's a monumental task. Compounding this picture, of course, though, is the length of time that some of these villages and towns were occupied. Six months is a very, very long time. Contrast that to the situation in Bucha, the alleged atrocities that unfolded there. Uh, Ukrainian officials have had some success prosecuting some of those atrocities, isolating individual soldiers, uh, taking them to court, essentially, for what happened there. But that area was occupied for a month. It also had heavy surveillance. Uh, it was heavily surveilled. There was closed-circuit cameras helping them build cases, helping them uh, Pull, pull, put together evidence. In the case of some of these villages here in Kharkiv, there is no surveillance footage, and six months is a very, very long time to have to go back and in each and every allegation trace exactly what happened, Holly. Right now, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands are under a tropical storm watch because of Fiona, the tropical storm tracking west right now over the Leeward Islands. It's expected to hit Puerto Rico this weekend, packing winds of 50 miles an hour. And the gusts, you know the gusts, they always go higher. It's going to be intense. But the bigger threat, it's not really the wind, it's the rain and the flooding. Because some spots could see as much as 15 inches. You're talking about the risk of mudslides. You're talking about really dangerous water levels there. And check this out. We don't often sit here and talk about the weather in Alaska. Okay, we don't. That tells you that this is a very big deal because people living along the northwest coast of Alaska are bracing for the worst storm there in more than a decade. The remnants of a typhoon expected to bring 90 mile an hour winds, a bunch of rain, a bunch of flooding. Bill Karens joins me now. And let me start with what's happening in Alaska because this is really serious. What does it mean for locals there? Uh, well, yeah, let me get to the Alaska graphics here, because we're talking about Nome, Alaska, especially. That's probably going to be the worst of it. And this was a typhoon. So this was out in the Pacific, and it was over the warm waters. Then as it went over the colder waters, all that energy was still there. And then it became this huge monster of a storm. And you can see the clouds from it. So there it is making a transition from a tropical system to what we call an extra tropical. And it is huge, bringing the cold front through the Aleutian Island change. But the real... Um, heart of this storm. The problems is going to be the high winds around the center. So the winds are blowing all of this water northwards. There was a buoy that had 41 foot waves in the middle of this storm early wow. this morning. So you know, imagine what a 41 foot wave look like. Uh, you know, a lot of us have seen those fishing shows from out here in the Bering Sea. It can get really ugly in a hurry. So a lot of these ships knew to get out of the way. But all this water is going to pile up. We have our main concern up here in areas near Nome. This is where they could see record storm surges up to 8 to 11 feet. So we talk about hurricanes all the time. A storm surge coming 8 to 11 feet. People evacuate. That's like, you know, horrendous down along the Gulf Coast or the East Coast. But even an extra tropical storm, doesn't have to be tropical in nature, can bring a storm surge like that. And that's what they're going to experience. It's going to be tonight, Hallie, and then tomorrow morning. And as you mentioned, too, winds up to 90 miles per hour. That's going to do some destruction also. Uh, go back. If you can, can you click yeah. back to your Caribbean can, graphics actually. then? And I'm sorry to have flipped the order amazing. on you there. But, no, that's all right. Um, you know, I, I think about people in Puerto Rico. Hurricane Maria was such a oh. huge catastrophe. They just people, you know, such a long recovery. And now, boom, major flood threat this weekend. 
Yeah, I think the biggest fear is the power outages. That's what they're thinking. They're thinking, oh, God, you know, if we get a storm like that again and we have to deal with all the power outages. So here's the latest on the storm. 50 mile per hour winds. It's heading to the west. So uh, again, 50 mile per hour winds isn't going to make like a huge deal as far as winds go. We shouldn't lose a lot of power out of it, but we will have to deal with the rainfall forecast out of this. And right now, with the storm going just south of Puerto Rico, it does look like we're going to get anywhere between 8 to 12 maximum as far as the highest amounts of rain go. So a foot of rain, some of the mountains in Puerto Rico, mudslides, debris flows, that could be problematic as we watch that again. Tomorrow into Sunday morning is when Puerto Rico will get the worst of it. Then we take the storm over the Dominican Republic Sunday, and then it could be a hurricane after this towards the uh, Turks and Caicos, Hallie. As of now, it looks to curve out to sea, not heading for the U.S. East Coast, but we never give up on these storms until they actually do curve away. Bill Karens, thank you so much. I know we'll be talking again, I am yep. sure, in the days to come. Coming up here on this show, air travel chaos in France. Hundreds of flights canceled. We'll tell you why air traffic controllers there are going on strike. Plus, Michael Jordan still breaking records. How much a jersey from his last dance era just sold for? We'll blow your mind after the break. Vice President Kamala Harris in Chicago right now asking voters to protect abortion rights in the midterms, making a big push for that. Of course, the midterms, what, 50 plus days away, 52, I think. It comes after we saw the vice president earlier talking reproductive rights and health care with state leaders and advocates. The goal here to put a focus on these key issues after Roe versus Wade was overturned this summer. Today, Vice President Harris saying the women of America have the ability to exercise their own judgment in making decisions about their own bodies. Model Chrissy Teigen now getting candid about the moment she lost her son Jack two years ago at 20 weeks, saying she only just realized it was actually a life-saving abortion, not a miscarriage. Speaking at a summit in California, she now says it was an abortion to save my life for a baby that had absolutely no chance. You might remember when all of this happened. It was a really big moment. Teigen was incredibly open, incredibly vulnerable about her experience losing her son because of pregnancy complications. You're looking at some of the pictures she posted online. She wrote about it. And it got a ton of attention. A little bit of backlash, too. Now, Tegan is saying she only realized that she'd had a life-saving abortion because of a conversation with her husband, John Legend, after the Supreme Court overturned Roe. She says, and I'm quoting here, I told the world we had a miscarriage. The world agreed we had a miscarriage. All the headlines said it was a miscarriage. And I became really frustrated that I didn't, in the first place, say what it was. Kathy Park is joining us now. And Kathy, this is getting, I think, so much attention right now as Tegan is, in a very public way, kind of showing how she connected the dots regarding what happened to her. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it, Hallie. So Chrissy Teigen is a celebrity who is known for being extremely candid and open about her personal life, and this was no exception. So yesterday she was here at an event here in California, and she opened about uh, opened up about her pregnancy journey and talked about how uh, late on in later on into her pregnancy she realized that her son Jack would not survive, and if she were to carry this baby to term, this would also impact her health. So uh, they needed medical intervention. As you mentioned uh, earlier in that statement, she called it a miscarriage at the time. But after having further conversations with her husband, John Legend, and after a decision from the Supreme Court regarding Roe v. Wade, that's when she was able to kind of put the pieces together and realize that she had a life-saving abortion. And just kind of adding to her honesty, she said she felt silly at the time um, and kind of looking back that it took almost a year to come to this realization, Hallie. And what she is talking about here, the, the, the broader context is, and she put it specifically in the broader context of Roe versus Wade, right? And the idea that this for her was life-saving care. That is something that we have heard echoed from some abortion rights advocates. Yeah, that, that is absolutely right. And as you can imagine, Hallie, this is uh, resonating a lot on, on social media. In fact, I just checked her, her Twitter feed, and she is getting backlash as well uh, for being so open about this and, and you know putting a label on this um, and, and calling this an abortion. But on the flip side, you have other women who are praising her for her candidness and her, her openness because they are able to kind of connect with her because they have also gone through similar experiences and they are appreciating her, her frankness and regardless of, of labels, ultimately they say that here is a woman who is still grieving the loss of a child.
Allie. And to be clear, Kathy, she didn't, She and I want you to help viewers understand this here and our listeners, she wasn't intentionally, she says, misleading people when she described it as a miscarriage. At the time, she felt like that's how it was characterized. It's only been recently, in these last few months, that she has sort of realized, well, wait a second, you know, this was actually, as she put it, a life-saving abortion. Exactly. I think, you know, she, like I said, she's being extremely vulnerable about um, her, her kind of putting all the pieces together because at the time uh, when she was going through this tragedy, she was explained to her that, look, she, she wasn't going to be able to carry this baby to term. And then if she did, this would, would potentially kill her a, as a mother. So she had to make the very difficult decision of having to go through this medical procedure. But it really took some time. Um, and after all the headlines and, and her having this conversation personally, Personally, with her family or husband yeah. was when she she made this realization. Kathy Park live for us there in LA. Kathy, thank you. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, take a look at this video from Central Italy today. Ton of rain and major flooding, tsunami-like they're calling it. At least 10 people were killed. Four others are still missing. More than 2,000 people lost power or water. Number two, something like half the flights scheduled to land in or leave from Paris today were canceled. A whole bunch of others that would have flown over France were canceled too. Why? Air traffic controllers there are striking, and that is creating a chaotic domino effect in air travel all across Europe. You had hundreds of other flights delayed. The big union for air traffic controllers there says workers want more money, with the walkouts happening at least partly because of inflation. Number three, Nissan recalling more than 200,000 pickups in this country because they can roll away unexpectedly when they're in park. The recall covers Titan and Frontier pickups from 2020 through 2023 model years. The company says it hadn't heard of any crashes or people getting hurt and that people should use the parking brake anytime you park your truck. They're still working on repairs. Number four, one in five American households have medical debt, including people who have private insurance. That's according to new research published in the journal JAMA, Network Open. Researchers found on average, the sort of average household in this country owes something like $4,600 in medical debt. Number five, one of Michael Jordan's jerseys from his last dance season sold at auction for a record-breaking $10.1 million. Ouch. That's the most ever paid for anything Won, like, like worn during a sports game. Like any player puts it on his, his or her back and then sells it, that's like all the money. It's another record. Jordan wore it during game one of the NBA Finals in 1998. When we come back, the White House. They want more regulations on crypto. We're getting into what's in it, including a new kind of digital dollar. You ready for it? You should be. Crypto industry is paying a lot of attention today to the first ever framework put out by a White House covering possible crypto regulations in the United States. The Biden administration wants regulators like the SEC and the Commodity Futures Trading Commission to dig in on crypto oversight. So basically, yes, they want more eyeballs on crypto with more than a billion dollars in cryptocurrency lost to fraud since the start of last year, according to the FTC. There are consequences for illegal activity being proposed, like there's a push for Congress to boost fines for illegal money transfers and tap in DOJ to prosecute these kinds of digital crimes. This new framework also says there may be some significant benefits to a digital version of the dollar. This is like the dollar's digital twin. Mackenzie Segalos joins us now. So Mackenzie, let's talk timeline. Digital dollar, when can I pay for something with it? Like in five years or in 30 years? Right. So that's a question that a lot of people have, Hallie. And right now it's unclear. What I'm hearing is it likely something on the magnitude of years if they decide to follow through with this. We're still very much in the exploratory phase where you have the Fed looking into this or researching it. Uh, and, and the White House was very complimentary of what a CBDC, the central bank digital currency, could accomplish. They said it would lead to a more you know, efficient monetary system. It would make cross-border transactions faster. They urged the Fed to continue their research into what this would look like. I will say this, Fed Chair Jay Powell previously said that the main use case, main incentive for actually creating a CBDC would be to uh, eliminate the use case for crypto coins in America. And since, like, since he said that, we saw the implosion of one of the most popular U.S. dollar-pegged stablecoin projects, so certainly more of an incentive there. 
By way of comparison, China, which is the country that's probably furthest along with developing its own CBDC, has been working on it since 2014, and they're still in the pilot phase right now. That's interesting. It feels like a lot of the energy around the crypto world is partly due to the fact that it is sidestepping government regulation, right? So does this move by the White House, does it have the potential to maybe cool off the crypto market? Well, you know, it's funny because when President Biden in March issued this executive order that set off the six months of research that culminated in this framework that came out today, the crypto market, there was so much exuberance there. You know, a lot of the players were just so grateful to have some clarity. They also thought that what President Biden suggested in that executive order was the best case scenario with respect to regulation. And in terms of reaction in the crypto markets to what we saw in that framework released this morning, there hasn't been much. I mean, there hasn't been much movement in the price of cryptocurrencies. Hmm. And I think that's because there aren't a lot of concrete next steps offered, just a lot of hypotheticals about what regulation could ultimately look like. Definitely one to watch. Mackenzie, thank you. Good to see you. Coming up, one big company threatening to pull its partnership with the Phoenix Suns if its owner keeps being a part of the franchise. He's the one who just got suspended by the NBA. We'll tell you more next in The Local. So in just the last few minutes, as we've been on the air here, we're getting some new details on how the process for an independent third party, looking at those classified documents taken from former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago home, how that's going to work. You've got New York Senior District Judge Raymond Deary asking former President Trump and DOJ lawyers, well, not the former president himself, but his team, right, the attorneys for both sides, to show up in Brooklyn. He's hauling them to New York. He wants them there on Tuesday. We've just found out. That says any moment now, we expect the DOJ to appeal because Judge Aileen Cannon, the Trump-appointed judge overseeing this case, disputes the government's argument that all those documents are actually classified. Ken Delanian is joining us to break this down. You know we love buckets here on the show, Ken. Let's take bucket number one, <laughs> which is this new detail about these two um, attorney teams being summoned to Brooklyn next week. How's this going to work? So, Hallie, the uh, judge in Florida gave the parties 10 days to sort of craft a plan with the special master and come back to her about how this is all going to work. And now we see that Judge Raymond Deary uh, is, is getting quickly off the dime here. He's already scheduled a meeting for Tuesday where they're going to sort of work out the logistics. Uh, you know, in terms of so obviously the documents have to be brought to Brooklyn right now. Most of them, if not yeah, all how? of them, are in well, most of them are like in, in Washington. <laughs> this is a Washington <laughs> field office case. So uh, we believe that most of these documents are in Washington. So the ones that aren't classified classified can be transported any old way. Yeah, probably a truck. Throw uh, them in the mail, right? Yeah. I'm kidding, but, but right. But the highly classified documents, it, this is what's so bizarre about this whole thing. These are documents, the ones marked special access programs and TSSEI, they are normally never outside of a secure facility. And when they are, there there's strict rules for how they have to be transported in a locked case with, with FBI agents or, you know, usually they do it incognito. It's not like with armed guards or whatever. But, you know, there's a whole, there's actually rules written down about how those super classified documents have to be transported. But I guess that's what they're going to have to do to take them to Brooklyn. This is something the Justice Department, believe me, does not want to do. They've said that those classified documents are stored in a special facility and they would like them right. to stay there. But they have no choice at this point unless they are granted a stay by the appeals court. OK, that brings us to bucket number two, which is this appeal that we sort of expected the DOJ, I kind of thought, to file like 24 hours ago, maybe, Ken. Um, we still think that's going to happen, right, that they're going to ask another judge to reverse the order that, that this whole thing has to go down in the first place. Yes, all signs are pointing to an appeal being imminent, and we're not exactly sure what the appeal is going to say. But when the Justice Department filed a notice to, that it was going to appeal a while ago, they suggest that they're going to appeal the entire order, the whole thing. They don't want a special master in this case at all. They don't believe it's called for. Um, but they're also asking a more, they're making a more narrow request, at least they did to the judge, and we anticipate they may make the same request to the appeals court, which is give us an immediate temporary stay right now on the part of the order that says we can't use these classified documents in our criminal investigation because the Justice Department says this is a matter of national security. We need to move on this. We need to figure right. out what happened with those documents. So I anticipate they will ask the 11th Circuit in Atlanta to grant that. And then, you know, this is a court that is filled with Trump appointed judges. But, uh, you know, a lot of legal experts say the Justice Department has has a really strong hand here with that request. So we'll see what happens. Ken Delaney and Stan on top of all of those moving pieces for us. Thank you, sir. 
You bet. So the Biden administration and Senate Democrats are racing against the clock right now before the midterms to push through as many judicial nom nominees as possible just this week, confirming yet another three of them. Now stop. Hang on a second, people. Wait. I can see your eyeballs glazing over. OK, because, yes, we're talking knobs, but you have to unglaze them because this is super important and super interesting and it affects your life and maybe your kid's life or maybe your kid's kid's life. OK, your actual personal life. Why? Go back to the Donald Trump days. Right. You know, he and Republican Senator Mitch McConnell essentially reshaped the federal judiciary. Republicans, look at this, confirming 231 federal judges and justices over the last few years. That's about 30 percent of the entire federal bench, 30 percent. So now Democrats are like, whoa, sprinting to try and catch up. They're trying to get their own judges on the bench, working fast. And you know this all matters to people's lives. The obvious example, of course, is the Supreme Court. Former President Trump cemented a conservative majority there by getting three of his justices on, a conservative majority that, of course, overturned Roe versus Wade. Yeah, OK, that's the Supreme Court. That's a little different than your average circuit or district court. But those lower courts, they're kind of a big deal especially if you're somebody who cares about gun reforms or voting access or LGBTQ plus rights. On all of those things, Trump appointees just made key rulings. A Texas judge blocked the Biden administration from overturning Title 42, that Trump era immigration policy. So, yeah, this stuff matters. And Democrats are trying to make their mark now and fast, because if they lose the Senate come November, all of this work comes to a screeching halt. I want to bring in now Sahil Kapoor. And Sahil, you've got Chuck Schumer, the top Democrat in the Senate, President Biden, the White House, everybody working hand in hand to move fast, right? And right now, you've got President Biden outpacing where former President Trump was by this point in his presidency. That's absolutely right, Hallie. President Biden right now has confirmed uh, 82 judges through the Senate compared to what Trump did at this point in his presidency, which was 68 judges. Now, the crucial thing to know is that this is not the end of the chapter. We know that Donald Trump, uh, the Republican-led Senate at the time, led by Mitch McConnell, really hit the gas on uh, Trump-appointed judges in the last two years of his presidency. And this is where uh, the stakes are so high for President Biden and voters in the 2022 midterm elections. It's all about which party controls the Senate. If it stays in Democratic hands, it will be Chuck Schumer who will uh, keep his hands on the wheel here, continue to prioritize votes in the Senate on uh, Biden's judicial nominees. Whereas if Republicans take control, it would go back to Mitch McConnell to decide if and when any of these judges get a vote again. We know McConnell has used some extraordinary tactics in the past to steer the courts to the right, blocking liberal judges under Democratic presidents like Barack Obama from getting a vote while paving the way, uh, doing everything he can to hold votes and speedy votes on conservative judges under presidents like Donald Trump. So that's kind of the binary choice for voters in key swing states like Georgia and Pennsylvania and Arizona. In terms of judges, one of the most important uh, aspects of President Biden's legacy going forward. There are currently, and I have the number written down here, 43 uh, nominees pending in vacancies. That number is going mm. to grow because more are going to retire. 82 confirmed at this point, And there is a factor here that we should talk about regarding representation and diversity. Yes, there is. This is one of the unique things that President Biden has done, which is pick uh, judges that, in his view, in the view of the White House, look more like the United States. He's posted record shares of judicial nominees who are uh, who are black, who are Hispanic, who are Asian American. Three quarters of his judges as of July were women, which is extraordinary. There's also diversity in experience, too. And this is the part that progressive advocates I talked to, Hallie, are even more excited about than the racial ethnic diversity that uh, President Biden has broken not only from uh, previous Republican predecessors, but also from President Obama in selecting more public defenders uh, for the federal courts, in selecting more civil rights lawyers and more union side labor lawyers. It used to be this pipeline that both parties kind of agreed on that if you're a corporate lawyer or a successful prosecutor, uh, you had a good pipeline to the federal judiciary. The Biden White House looked at that and said, we don't want to do that anymore. We want more public defenders uh, on the court. And the human embodiment of this philosophy, uh, the diversity on both counts, Hallie, is Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, who represents that, uh, both, both that racial ethnic diversity as well as uh, the experiential diversity. Sahil Kapoor, thank you so much for breaking that down for us. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Southeast Bureau, one student is missing, another hospitalized in Florida. 
Members of the North Orlando Rowing Club were on the water when lightning apparently hit in the area overnight. The boat capsized. We don't know yet how old the students were, but our affiliate reports high school and middle school students were practicing at the time. We're obviously going to keep an eye on that. From our West Coast Bureau, California's governor signed a big bill today into law that dramatically cuts how much oil and gas the state will use in the next couple decades. It's part of the state's push to become carbon neutral by 2045. The governor's office hopes it'll create millions of jobs there, too. Also from our West Coast Bureau, PayPal says it will not renew its partnership with the Phoenix Suns if owner Robert Sarver returns, according to CNBC. Earlier this week, we told you Sarver was suspended for a year and fined 10 million bucks over allegations of workplace violations, including harassment of female employees. CNBC's reached out to the Suns and its big sponsors for comment. Still to come, a new study looks at how Latinas and Latinos are influencing streaming and entertainment in America. Where do you hear some of these numbers? We're getting into it next. As the Hispanic Heritage Month begins, we're seeing just how much of an influence Latinos have in the media, especially in streaming. A new Nielsen study finds that while Latinos and Latinas make up almost 19 percent of the population in this country, nearly half the shows considered to be the most bingeable had Latinas and Latinos in front of and behind the cameras in some capacity. And listen, most Latinos say they want to see themselves in the content they watch, but they also want shows to represent them better. Only 41% of Hispanics say representation they see feels accurate. Nielsen's senior VP, Stacey De Armas, says that has to do with the genres we see Latinos and Latinas in. We saw that Latinos are best represented in crime and crime drama, and the lowest representation is in genres such as action, adventure, and news. So if you can imagine, no wonder that they see that representation doesn't necessarily reflect their true lived experiences if a lot of it is in crime. Morgan Chesky is joining us now to talk this through. And it's such interesting data, Morgan, because it shows that many people in this community are, are watching a ton of streaming, right? TV, movies, and streaming. But when it comes to taking a lead in these projects, representation is still pretty low. Yeah, Hallie, you're absolutely right. And the numbers really do tell this story here. And that's why the study is so interesting. Well, no doubt be study for months to come as content is developed uh, in the years ahead. But one thing that you mentioned stood out, you have 18% of the U.S. population now Latina, one of the fastest growing segments in the United States population. And when you looked at what comprised the characters that we see on TV, on streaming platforms, in multiple categories, even though you have 18% of the U.S. population is Latino, the top category was just 8% uh, of whether it being an ensemble or a the number of Latino actors or actresses in a particular show, 8%. So they are not even close to matching the current U.S. population right now. And that is why we are hearing from uh, leaders in the industry, such as Eva Longoria from, um, you know, Desperate Housewives, who has established groups to uh, essentially become advocates for more Latinos, uh, not just in front of the camera, but behind it as well. Allie? You, you, over the last few years, we have seen some shows led by Latinos or Latinas get rave reviews, critical darlings, right, loyal followings, and then still get canceled. W what's up with that? It all comes back down to diversity, and there's a couple different answers to that particular question. Number one, it's not just Latino representation that's lacking in front of the camera, but also at an executive level. These are what are essentially called the gatekeepers when it comes to which show is going to stick around, which show is going to get canceled. And as a result of that, we have several leaders in the industry, particularly one uh, professor who studies the impact of Latinos in new media, say that immediately, as soon as a Latino-led show comes out, it's under a microscope, whereas a predominantly white show may be able to last three, four, five seasons uh, before it's finally canceled. I know that the Gordita Chronicles is a recent example of a show that was totally. on HBO Max, and it was canceled after just one season. And there were a, a lot of uh, its fan base that were admittedly disappointed, and they didn't understand why it wasn't given a chance to develop an audience and thrive, whereas other shows uh, featuring uh, more white characters are. 
historically, there hasn't been a, uh, always a lot of representation for members of this community in the media. And so I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about this shift and the importance of what it means, e even though there is obviously, as you have laid out, still a ways to go here. Yeah, the shift is going to be really interesting because when you do look at these same numbers, Hallie, the Latino audience, uh, while it's growing across the country, it's not necessarily the fastest rising with network television and with the number of streaming platforms now in the hundreds uh, offering thousands of content choices. Uh, we do know that I guess one upside here is that expect to see more um, shows, films, podcasts even developed specifically with a Latino audience in mind uh, in the years ahead, because especially here in Texas, where they are the fastest growing segment uh, of the population, uh, the representation on a national scale will only grow. And while it might take time, uh, leaders in the industry say that there are steps being made, although admittedly, uh, those steps for more uh, Latinos being represented uh, not coming fast enough. Allie. Morgan Chesky, uh, thank you so much for that breakdown. Appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for watching us on this Friday evening. That does it for this hour. We will have much more for you here Monday, same time, same place. We'll see you then. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.